We are in a zone between heaven and hell, between light and darkness. We are the only creatures who are in this realm. And we have the privilege of going up into light, brighter, 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 or going down into darkness, darker, 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 darker. So um, one time God gave me the word that we are in a twilight zone. We're in a zone where humanity can become devils. You can go so low that you become a devil. And you can get so high that you become an angel of God. Um, we, I don't need to preach to you to tell you that you can see that some men have already received the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is that God made man spirit, soul, and body. The spirit connects you with God's spirit. So he's pulling you up. The soul is in the middle and the spirit is connected to the soul. But the soul lives in a body and the body is connected to the earth. So while one is pulling down, the other is pulling up. And Every human being is in a position to choose whether he wants to go down or up. And so, in my understanding, when I talk about the rapture, I am talking about getting higher with God. And getting so high with God that you get out of the natural into the spiritual completely like where Jesus Christ was. He said the son of man which is in heaven. So you can experience heaven right here. Hallelujah. Or you can experience hell. Uh, the church, you come into a meeting like this. And the meeting is either low down, flat on the ground, or you see it rising, 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 and coming up to a level. And this morning, we have been rising, and I want to, you to keep rising so that your mind will become passed with heavenly things rather than with earthly things. Amen. So... God took a nation, a people, and it's not because these people were better than other people or more numerous than others, but these people, God chose them, and you cannot quarrel with God. Amen. So when God chooses you, you have nothing to say about it. It's not because you're a good thing, you know. Why God choose you. I am pretty and God choose me because of my beauty. Nothing of the kind. God choose you because God choose you. And there's nobody, nothing that can give an answer or a reason why God chose the Jews. Except that he chose one man. And that man was very faithful. And he called him the father of the faithful. And because he was the father of the faithful, he became the father of a nation of people. And that nation of people affected the whole earth. So that whereas the earth was going down, down, down into hell, that nation began to give principles and everything that would begin to rise up. And now the difference between a beast and a man is that your spirit is subject to God's spirit. He has a pull on you. 
and your soul is attached to your spirit and there's a love, a, a, a bind in a marriage yet to be consummated between your spirit and your soul. Because there's a third man coming in and this third person is the body. And the body wants to marry the soul. But God said to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. So a tug of war goes on, and any side you go on, that's the side that's going to win. So if you become carnal, you're going down. If you remain spiritual, you're going up. And so this morning, we want to encourage you to be spiritual and to actually turn your minds to the things of God. Now, God wrote things in the Bible for the Jews. The Jews. He talked to them and he showed them life and he made certain promises to them and he made everlasting promises to them. Now, can you make an everlasting promise to a person or a thing that is not everlasting? How would you like that? Somebody, my mother used to say, it is like a side pocket to a dog. <laughs> Give him two beautiful side pockets. He has no hands. You see? So, no, God would not make an everlasting promise to a people who are not everlasting. And for a long time, we could not differentiate between the Old Testament and the New Testament what it is saying. But God did something. He sent a man named Paul. And that man studied, he was a doctor of New Te Old Testament law. And he knew all about the law. And then all of a sudden, God knocked him down on the road to Damascus while he was going to persecute Christians and took him unto himself. And he went 14 years out into the desert to understand what God is doing. He didn't just jump up and start preaching. 14 years. And after the 14 years, he came to teach the church what God had been saying in the Old Testament as against the New. Now, the Old Testament is what we call um, the shadow. Now, you cannot have a shadow unless you have substance. You must have light. You must have substance. Then it casts a shadow. So therefore, the shadow is there, the substance is here, and the light is here. And if you come towards the substance, when you meet the substance, then you don't have to look at the shadow again. But if you cannot understand the substance, you will look at the shadow, and you see an arm sticking out. You said, he has an arm. And you know what exactly where the arm is because that's what... What I'm saying to you is that we're going to read the Old Testament this morning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is... A, all, all I'm saying is that we're going to read some things in the Old Testament. And we're going to read some of the promises that God gave to Israel. Which promises Paul gave to the church. Let's turn around to um, it's um, Exodus 19. We want to talk about the evening sacrifice. That, that is the word that we're going to bring to you. The evening sacrifice. Hallelujah. For there was a sacrifice in the morning and there was one at noon. But we are involved 
in the evening sacrifice. So that's what we're going to talk about. It's chapter 19 of Exodus. And um, we, we could read from verse... Let's, let's read from verse 3 so we get a little of the context. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, This thus, sh thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Come on now. Why would God say Jacob and Israel? Isn't, Israel, isn't Jacob Israel? But Israel is not Jacob. Are you with me? All right. Let's go on. Jacob means the carnal Jew. And in scripture for us, we translated the carnal Christian. And Israel is the whole church. So he wants to speak to Jacob and to Israel. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Therefore, our destination is Christ. He is bringing us unto himself. It sounds very selfish, but I love and God is selfish. Amen. Because he's bringing me unto himself. That means I'm going to melt into him and I'm become a part of God. Can you imagine that? God is promising a people that he will redeem them from their naturalness, from their carnality, and bring them unto himself. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar people. Treasure, sorry. A peculiar treasure. And an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, we, we love treasure. We, we, we love treasure. I mean, I think if treasure comes here now and they put down some outside and said anybody who can get out there first will get as much as you can take that this place would be emptied in a short space of time. Everybody would run out to get some treasure. So, have you ever thought of it that what God counts to be valuable? Now, we count money. We count gold. The epitome of money, gold. We count gold. And God count you as his treasure. In other words, you make God rich. That's the value of humanity before God. He says, you are my treasure. He said, I will take you as a peculiar, not just an ordinary little stone, but a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests what that what is that what is that do you know that when you lay hands on a person 
you are actually putting your life on the line for that person. Did you know that's what it means? Did you know that God made the people of Israel lay their hands on the priest and confess their sins over him and their sins left them and went into the priest? Amen. You know, I've seen it happen. It, we, we had situations where brothers went and laid hands on people and they didn't have the, the, the spiritual virtue or energy to counteract the thing yes. that was in that person and it came back upon them. Yes. I, 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 one day we, we were called up into a mountain top to um, go and pray for a woman who was possessed with some devil. And we all went left to go and this young man um, uh, brother, uh, well, I don't call his name because, you know, the tape is going everywhere. He's dead anyhow. He, <laughs> he cut a shortcut through the bushes and got up there first. What he wanted to have the, uh, the what do you call it? The glory of being the person who delivered the woman. If you have those kind of things in you, keep away from demons. They'll kill you. Because they can, they can spot a wrong thought anywhere. And the boy ran up there, lays hands on the woman. When we came, when we got there, he was crippled. His hand was withered. And we never got him better. And he, he started having epileptic seizures. And he had it until he died. We could not bring deliverance to him. You have to beware of what you, how you lay hands. Because you remember in Hebrews chapter 6, Paul speaks of the laying on of hands as part of our foundation doctrine. You need to have that foundation doctrine well secured in your foundation. Do you understand? Because laying on of hands, you are actually accepting the problem that the person has onto yourself. When the woman who had the issue of blood, and you can imagine it was some sin that gave her that issue of blood. You know, we, we nowadays, we would say it might have been some venereal disease. And she grabbed the hem of Jesus' garment. And Jesus said, I feel virtue come out of me. Huh? Do you realize when you lay hands on a person, you are giving out virtue? Yes. He said, I feel virtue come out of me. Yes. Said, but everybody is touching you and rubbing against you. No, 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 not that. Something else. There was a deliberate action that pulled the virtue out of me. You know what action that is? Faith. The woman believed it. I am telling you, you do not know how strong faith is. I had a case where um, a sister that I know, we used to fellowship with them. She was sick and she went into the hospital. And... Bes on the bed beside her, they had two people in the room. On the bed beside her was um, Sister Walsh. I'm calling her name because um, if she hears this tape, I want her to get in touch with me. There was this woman <laughs> on the bed. She was in a car accident. The car turned over on her side. 
She was pinned underneath the car. This bone, the hip bone, was crushed. And when they took her to the hospital, they had to take out the, I don't know what you call this bone, brother sister, but the, 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 the hip bone, they had to take it out. And so the rest of the leg was just hanging on flesh. There was no bone there. She's on the bed beside this sister, a friend of mine. And they are preparing her for amputation. But she's too weak, so they have to kind of strengthen her up first before the amputation. So the sister said to her, don't let them amputate your leg. I know a man that will pray for you and your leg. No, come on now. I'm talking about faith. One person, a stranger, lying on a bed, tell you that she knows a man who if he prays for you, you will walk, although you don't have any leg. And she, she believed it. <laughs> My God. <laughs> she believed it. She believed it with all her heart that she told the doctor, no, I will not amputate. The doctor says, you're an idiot. He says, this is going to kill you. He said, you will be dead soon. And it so happened that she was a nurse. And the, the doctors in our hospital, one doctor, he got so mad. Some idiot made a fool out of you. And you are going to die. And, 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 and he got so mad. He said, if you walk, I will serve God for the rest of my life. Amen. That's all God wanted to hear. <laughs> So, um, I was in a meeting uh, at the school where I taught. Um, we had um, one brother from America here uh, preaching. And so, I was in the meeting. Night, night, the meeting is over, and I'm walking to my classroom in the darkness. And suddenly, a woman ran down on me and grabbed me and said, Here is the man, here is the man. So, I thought I was being mugged. <laughs> But um, when the, the other lady came down, she said, Brother Dussel, this is Sister Walsh. I want you to pray for her. She, uh, she has been, and they tell me the story of what happened to her. I felt so uh, inept. <laughs> I have no power to pray for you. I felt wretched. I said, all right, sister. You, you, you go home, and I, my wife and I will pray, and uh, we'll see what God will say. <laughs> but we were really afraid of the situation. <laughs> Women have no leg, and, and we are to pray for her that she could walk. Well, she never stopped bothering me. I mean, I had no rest. I'm going to do something, boom, the phone ring. Are you coming now? No. I'd come tomorrow, uh, another day, and next day, and it kept on, and she kept on, until my soul got bitter in me. I said, my God, you will have to heal this person. <laughs> and so we were at school, and, and, and um, suddenly the Lord said, go. So I said to Mavis, we, we closed up our classes, and we decided to go to the... We went, and it began to rain behind us. <laughs> and we ran to the bus, and it, the rain followed us. And when we got into the bus, the rain came on the bus. And the bus took us to her house, and we came out, and the rain was behind us again. And we ran, actually, to get to her door. And we got into our door, and the rain came down in showers. And we begin, to, we begin to tell her about Jesus. She, but she was patiently waiting. She didn't want to hear anything else but for us to pray for her. Faith, I'm telling you, faith will do anything. I, we knelt down. Mavis knelt there. I knelt there. 
This woman sat upon a high chair with the leg hanging down. I held on to the leg, maybe she held on to the leg. And you remember what you felt in Africa, brother? An energy, an electrical charge coming through the woman's leg and shaking my hands. I said, um, me, you feel anything? She said, yes. So I said, take your hand off. Uh, not no charge, put it back, and this charge, this electrical charge, jerking our hands. And we say, in the name of Jesus Christ, just walk. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And she, remember now, she has on a, a brace. So she took off the brace. Because she had to have a brace to be able to even use the, um, the, 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 the crutches. And she took off the brace, and we said, all right. I held her one side, maybe she held her one side, and we walk around the table. And then we, she walked around the table. And she f said she feel like she's falling down on her face. We said, okay, you keep on. And by the time we had finished with her, she was walking on her own, walking up and down, praising God. <laughs> So she put on the braces next morning to go to work. And she said nothing to anybody. At midday at lunchtime, she's sitting on a, a high chair with her legs hanging down. And one of the nurses came up to her. I mean, God can use sinners, you know. And the nurse said to her, Walshi, you look to me like you could walk. I guarantee you can't come off of that thing and walk to me right now. And the girl came off and walked to her and she almost fainted. I didn't go back to check up on that doctor. But brother, I don't think God will let him off the hook. Faith. By faith then. We are going to fit the bill of God, not because we're righteous, not because we're pretty, not because we're good, not because we're better than anybody else, but we believe what God says. He will make you a royal priesthood. Amen. Now, a priest, a priest, God created the priesthood to be a mediator between God and man. Do you know that's what a priest is? Yes. So when Jesus Christ came, Jesus became the mediator between God and us. So the priesthood was abolished. <laughs> but then he said he had a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Who is this Melchizedek? Well, you make up your mind, you tell me. Abraham went to battle and he overcame the five kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and them. And then when he was coming back, here comes a man to him and he says, who are you? And he says, he's the king of Salem. Hmm? King of Salem. And Abraham recognized that it was God. And he gave him a tent of all his ties. You know, I always wonder what he did with it. <laughs> May have to just put it up into smoke or something. But he gave this king of Salem. And king of Salem is Jerusalem. Yes. City of peace. And so this, um, this, 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 this uh, situation brings us into something new. A new order of priesthood has been created. Are you with me? I said to God, Lord, help me, help Jamaica. God said, will you stand in the breach? 
Amen. Amen. You are standing in the bridge for many people. Amen. The life of the whole world is depending upon a royal priesthood, Amen. a holy nation, Amen. and a peculiar people at this very time. Hallelujah. Now it's hard to believe. Many people don't believe it. But you have a boy, and the boy will not obey you. You say, don't do so and so. Don't do so and so. I said, oh, well, I'm a man. I can do what I want to do. And I, I uh, you know, you are not responsible. You know what happens? Down the road, when he gets into trouble, he comes right back to you. The whole trouble and everything is laid at your feet. You are responsible. God made me responsible for Jamaica. And I asked him, I said, Lord, he said, if my people who are called by my name, watch it now, beware of what you lay hands on. Because the moment you lay hands on it, you become responsible for it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Huh? He said he would hear from heaven. And what would he do? He would forgive your sins. In other words, he'd make you priest and heal your land. Don't you understand? But then, so, turn it into converse. If my people, that if there is a terrible thing, did not seek my face, did not humble themselves, did not pray, I will not heal their land. Are you there? We are talking about the evening sacrifice. And I don't know <laughs> if we'll be still friends after I am through. <laughs> I don't know if we'll still be friends. But then, I want you to turn with me to um, the 14th chapter. Um, what's it here now? Of... Um, Leviticus. Remember I told you I was going into the Old Testament? If we don't go there, we won't see certain things that we need to know. I said to you about the boy, the child. You know, I've, I've had some of them to deal with. Refuse to obey rules, refuse to walk in Christ, refuse to do righteousness. I am a man, I can do what I do. And then the trouble comes down, and to this day, we are under the pressure of the trouble. Because there are some things you can do in life which are everlasting, you know. Amen. When you w went to that girl, and told her you loved her and wanted her to marry you, you made an everlasting covenant. Amen. Amen. And there's no way, no, no, you better not think of how to get out of it because it is everlasting. So you can do some things, and some of the things that we have done in life, they are everlasting. Amen. Now, therefore, there are certain sins that will be committed in the world that cannot be uh, abrogated. The, 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 the people cannot get deliverance unless somebody else rises up and take the responsibility for it. I'm going to give you another story. I'm a storyteller, right? One day, I went up to my brother's house. 
my brother went to do to preach in an area that was Satan's kingdom. You, you, you remember one scripture said that you dwell where Satan's seat is? Yes. Well, this place is one of the places in the world where Satan's seat is. And he went up there to preach. And he started preaching and got a church. People began to be delivered, so that means God was with him. I went up to visit him, and with me was my um, assistant. <laughs> In those days, we called him Deacon. <laughs> and Deacon was a 250-pound man, one of the strongest men I'd ever seen. When he stomps, the, the windows rattle, and he, when he shout, praise God, the windows rattle. Now, I, I'm not telling you anything that is not true. <laughs> windows rattle and so you can imagine what it does to your ears sometimes this brother and I, I'm telling you that about him because this is one of the reasons that caused the trouble we went up to this how to visit my brother and the moment I stepped into his house I got totally crazy I didn't do it I just stepped into his house and I began to shout and rebuke the devil from out of his house. <laughs> Amen. His wife took sick. They had to ask me to leave because it was so bad. <laughs> we went on so bad that the crowd began to come down. And of course, it's the pastor of the church. And, and we had to leave. <laughs> But the work wasn't done, and she took sick. And the, her sickness was peculiar because today she would have one disease, tomorrow it would be another. And so she had what in those days they called polio. You all know what polio is. So then the, the, the limbs begin to be contorted and then twisted up and this polio took a hold of her I did not know I was 70 miles away now and my mother called me and said um, well Cecil she didn't say Cecil but let me say Cecil <laughs> she said your sister-in-law is dying and they're afraid to tell you because you might come and make a raucous and <laughs> blow down the hospital or something like that. So, so I started fasting. I called the whole church to fast. Monday morning we get into fasting and as I knelt down an angel came before me and he said um, hold this. He gave me a handle to hold. And he kind of pulled it out like it had some extension. And he pulled it out. And he went one measure. And he went another. And I'm following him. And when we got to the crossroads, it was about two, three miles from where we started. He stopped. He looked back at me. He said, who is going to pay for this? And when he did that, my heart just <laughs> leapt with fright. Who is going to pay for this? And I said, I will. He said, all right. <laughs> and he kept going. We got to the university hospital, which is 70 miles away. And he went, that she was lying in the bed, contorted up. Here it's a university hospital that had all the, the young doctors around observing how the polio is taking charge of the person. And the teacher was there. And this angel went in and he took a shaft and pushed it right down into her chest. And he turned to me and said, okay. And I know that I had to push it. 
And I said in the name of Jesus. And the woman jumped up into the ceiling. And was totally healed. Now what kind of a payment? Why did I have to pay for it? In spiritual sense, all the demons, hear me now, all the demons that were on her came on me. And if I don't have the virtue of God to get rid of them, I would be like her. Ah, glory to God. Amen. When you are called unto the priesthood of God, you are called unto suffering. Wife, if your husband is not walking in God, you are called to suffer and bring him by the power of Almighty God to serve God to his needs. Yes, when I saw my brother in sin, I said to God, it's either that this man is going to be saved or you kill me. I said, no more food to my mouth until Frank praised God. I stopped eating that day. Yeah, Sunday, I went to work Monday morning. And Saturday when I come, came back, I couldn't find him. Sunday, he was the next Sunday, he was saved and speaking in tongues. God says that the kingdom of God suffer violence. And the violent take it by force. If you don't mean what you are doing, get out of the business. Amen. Amen. Too many people are content for their neighbors to go to hell. Huh? You are content for their, your, 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 the people around to go to hell. You see them every day. And within a few years, a lot of them will be in hell. And you are having your breakfast every morning. Don't you understand? God has created a people for the saving and the deliverance of the world. Amen. And somebody said, but Jesus Christ died to save them. Oh, we don't have to do anything. Well, God said you'll be like him. And the more you get like Jesus is the more responsibility you have for the, everything that happens around you. For God has created a people to change the world. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we were looking at Leviticus. Um, chapter 14 and verse 12. And the priest shall take one he lamb. No, I don't want to read there first. I want to read. Where, verse 10, verse 10, and on the eighth day he shall take two he lambs without blemish and one yo lamb of the first year without blemish and three tenths deal of fine flour for a meat offering mingled with oil and one log of oil. <laughs> um, what, what brother Sam will call it now? The 10 gallon, uh, 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 the, uh, he has a, yes, the, the oil, a log of oil, he measured it and he said it is what? A gallon of oil? How much? Right. Two, two gallons of oil. Now, how would you like two gallons of oil to be poured over your head? Amen. Now, what are we talking about here? Now, you and I know that Jesus Christ is the Lamb. Amen. Have you ever thought 
that Jesus Christ was a Yolam or a Helam. Typology in scripture. Help me please. As a type in scripture, was Jesus Christ a Yolam or a Helam? A Helam or a Ram. Now, why? This here now is telling us about three lambs. It said there is a Helam, there is a Yolam, and another Helam. Now, unless you can describe this, uh, tell me what this scripture means. You know, I, I, I would really um, probably have to tell you what the Lord showed me. <laughs> so, and the priest that maketh him clean. No, no, quite. In other words, we are talking about a man who has leprosy. Now, in Old Testament, Leprosy means sin, sin, uncleanness. So we are all lepers. We were lepers, thank God. Amen. We were all lepers, and we have been made clean by the sacrifice of Calvary. But then, why were we made clean? It is that if God offered himself, Jesus offered himself for us, that we should not love our lives unto the debt. We should also offer ourselves for the deliverance of our fellow men. I tell you something. I'm skipping ahead and showing you something here. Jesus died. Jesus brought salvation. There are good men out there who can't believe it. Do you, do you know that? There are good people who can't believe it. And they have to get to a certain um, place in, 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 in conviction before they could believe it. Now, let me ask you something, Peter. You have some neighbors, right? And they know you. All right. Suppose the neighbors saw you were arrested and condemned as a terrorist. And they decided to execute you. And they executed you. And your paper was, your picture was in the newspapers and on the television. And everybody saw it. And your neighbors know that you are gone. And one day, exactly three and a half days afterwards, you walked over to your neighbor and said, hello. <laughs> now, you're, let's assume that your neighbor is an unbeliever. <laughs> Come on now. Tell me what would happen to that unbeliever. Yeah, he'd be a believer. <laughs> You have, you have given him absolute conviction. There would be no other reason for him to be an unbeliever after that moment. Amen. Hallelujah. Now the scripture says that when Jesus resurrected from the grave, he met the first person he talked to was Mary Magdalene. And when she ran in to tell the brothers, they say she's gone. She's hysterical. They, would, they couldn't believe it. No. Imagine God, Jesus told them time and time again, after three days, I will rise again, and so on. So they didn't understand what it means. They'd never seen anybody raise again. But yes, they saw Lazarus. But somehow or the other, it was too good to be true. Hang on. Now, those are believers. And yet, the power of unbelief was so strong on them. Now, if they would kill all of us, and the next thing, three and a half days' time, we start walking the street of Champagne and, and um, uh, Bratislava, 
and, and, uh, <laughs> and the Czech Republic, what would happen to all the people who knew us and knew we were killed and who were unbelievers? They would be shocked into belief. Well, let me read a scripture for you. Call you believer, I'm giving you a hypothetical case, and it is not. <laughs> Let us turn our Bibles to the 11th chapter of Revelation. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies. You notice that? He's making a spectacle of their dead bodies. See their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwelt upon the earth shall rejoice over them, make merry, merry Christmas, and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Brethren, the two prophets are nothing else but the body of Christ filled with the spirit and the, the, the spirit of, of, of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And the word of God. You know, I turned to God. I said, but God, can, can the spirit and the word die and their bodies be laid, laid in the street? You know what he said to me? Can't they? <laughs> oh, when he said that to me, I said, oh yes, Jesus did. Because Jesus was the embodiment of the spirit and the word. And he died and rose again. And so, if there's not a nation, a generation of people who come forth, die, and rise again in the physical flesh that men can see them, there, you cannot judge men of unbelief. Because there's a type of man who would believe if that happens. There's another type of man who would believe if you preach a word to him. But God is going to wring the earth clean of everyone that could be saved. And this is the last offering. Hallelujah. You said, oh, but it, it, why was it necessary for all the, children, the people of God to be killed? They, 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 they were eaten by lions. What an awful death that must be. They were, they were burned with fire. Amen. They were put to the sword. Why was it necessary? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here we see. Praise God. Yes, 5, 4, 5. And... And they shall turn away, verse 4, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, but which, by which, but which, but watch, though in all things endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full ministry, but that's not what I'm looking for. For I am now ready to be what? I thought you didn't need any more offering. I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. So Paul is saying, 
that because of his ministry, because of his, 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 his um, stewardship, amen, because of his priesthood, he was ready to be offered. Do you know that the priest offered himself first? When he went to the altar of incense, he offered himself. The people put their hands on him and they confessed their sins before him. Adultery, theft, yeah. lying, murder. And he took all of the sins and staggered in before God and offered up for himself and for the sins of Israel. And God accepted. The fire went up, the, 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 the smoke went up, and God accepted it. So therefore, there is an offering to take place in our time. An offering that soon will be. But let's read a little more about it because there were some people who were too poor to give the offering. Amen? Let's go back to, back to um, Leviticus there. There are some people who are too poor. Can you understand what that says? Hmm? Some people who are too poor to make the offering. Therefore, God says that the turtle dove, you should get two doves, and the doves would be for the offering for that person. Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, the Holy Ghost would, would come in. And on the eighth day, I'm sorry, we are at 14, chapter 14, and at verse, verse um, 10. And on the eighth day, he shall take two he lambs without blemish and one yo lamb. On the eighth day, what's that saying? That is saying that on the new beginning, eight is the number of new beginning, that God is going to create, amen, an offering. Now, Jesus first, then the church became the offering. But how would you like to be a Jew? How would you like to be a Jew in a time uh, before Jesus came? And all that the Jews went through. You know, sometimes I, I wondered, God said, go out there and kill the Amalekites. He said, kill them. Kill the dogs. Kill the cats. Kill the cows and the goats. Kill the children and the women. And most Christians said, that shouldn't be in the Bible. Uh, have you ever met any Christians who say it shouldn't be in the Bible? Amen. In Cuba, there is very little AIDS. In Cuba, there is very little AIDS. Castro handles AIDS like any epidemic should be handled. That is, you isolate the people who have the disease. Do you understand? If you had a communicable disease and you are sitting here with everybody, probably everybody would get outside, they would start having that disease and it would spread. So you take the person with the disease and you put them in a special place. And you take care of them there. Amen? Some diseases, when they take a hold, the disease of homosexuality, the disease of some sin, sinful diseases, God, in the Bible, handles it by fire. I don't know if you notice that. Everywhere you see that disease, God burn out the place. Hallelujah. No, the Bible says 
that when Joshua went into Canaan land, God tell him, burn the cities. And the scripture deliberately said, but this city, the Lord said, don't burn it. And that city, don't burn it. Why? Why do you want to burn a city? Fire must burn up everything in the city, kill every living thing. Because of a, a disease that would destroy the whole human race. That's it. And God is God. God is God. I, I, some of us won't approach God as God. We're approaching him with reason. No, that's not good. That's not right. You approach God who create and destroy. Amen. And when he destroy, he's creating. Amen. He creates and he destroys. I used to go as a child to a potter's house. And this potter would teach us as children how to make different vases and so on, so on, so And you had to have special clay. The clay had to be clean. Sometimes you have to rub in the clay and you feel a little piece of thing in it and you have to take it out and keep on molding. And sometimes the clay dies. Dead clay. Can't, can't make pottery anymore. Scrape it off. Put on a new lump. You create, you destroy. Nobody goes around and says, I am a man that destroys beautiful vases. Hmm? It was a beautiful vase, but it wasn't right, so I destroyed it. Make another one. So God is saying to you, if we can trust God as being God, he said in this Bible, certain places he destroyed it completely. He burnt out the cities. He did not leave root or branch. You said, then why isn't he doing it now? I'm telling you now, I'm telling you now, it's been done. It's been done. Only the difference is that salvation, okay, God says where there is innocent blood, somebody who shed innocent blood, by man shall his blood be shed. That's the law. Amen. But then because of Jesus Christ, if you shed innocent blood and you repent, then the blood of Jesus covers the innocent blood and, and the land is not marred with blood. But what we are doing, we, we, we are saving the murderers. We are saving the murderers and the murderers are being saved to murder more. And the spirit of murder is coming forth in them. You know, you read the Ten Commandments, and I do not understand, and I do not know why the translators put, thou shalt not kill. Because when you put, thou shalt not kill, it is saying that those people who God tell to kill, something was wrong. The Bible did not say so. It said, thou shalt not murder. And murder is different from killing. You know, because the man who pulls the, 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 the thing to execute or to hang someone who's saying they're planning to hang him, eh, somebody who pulls the trigger, he would be a murderer just as the murderer that he killed. But he's not. Because the Bible did not say thou shalt not kill. It said thou shalt not murder and they wrote kill. Because the word for murder, please look it up, um, Bible students. When you go home, you look it up, and you find out that there's a word for murder, and there's a word for kill. See, So, God Almighty is saying that he's creating a people, and you are going to be in the company of the Lamb. In the morning, Jesus Christ died. Thank God, he gave us his blood, he saved us from our sins. In the middle of the day, the church and all those who go towards bringing this church here started away with Abraham, coming right back through the whole nation of the Jews, bringing forth Jesus Christ, 
bringing forth life in my soul. We become the next lamb. The last lamb to be offered is the two witness company. Amen. Now, let, 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 let me go on a little here. The, the priest shall take one lamb and offer him for a trespass offering and a log of oil and shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. Hallelujah. There, shall be, there was an offering made. And the next offering, amen, was the yo lamb. Hmm. The yo lamb. No, the scripture would never refer to Jesus as a she lamb. So what God is doing is saying he has a church that is going to be walking in his footsteps and walking in his precepts. A church that will lay down their lives to bring in the harvest of God. This is what the Yo lamb is. But then, he said there's another lamb to be offered in the evening. And that lamb <laughs> is all the lambs put together. <laughs> because another he lamb. Let, 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 let me take you to Revelation. If you go to Revelation chapter 12, and you see the woman who bring forth the man child. Hallelujah. I, I, I jump ahead because, you know, I, I want to keep you in understanding what I'm saying while we go ahead, go along. If I'm too long, somebody tell me. Okay? Promise me, Peter? Yes. Good. So I'm, I'm insurance now. I can go right ahead. <sighs> And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. She being with child, cried travailing birth, and pain to be delivered, and there appeared a dragon, another wonder in heaven, but a red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars out of heaven, so and so. And she brought forth, verse 5, a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. We're talking about a church, a church standing on a church, pregnant with a church, bringing forth a church. And that is the last church, which is no longer a she-church. It's a he church. <laughs> but then why, what is this? Why, why did he, he change from a woman to a man? Because the, the church is now having the power in himself. Christ is part of that church now. And when you see the man is man and Christ, man and God, just like Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus Christ is bringing forth a people who will be filled with Christ. And a church that will be filled with Christ. And so the brethren said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. We don't know how to pray. Teach us how to pray. He said, when you pray, say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Praise your God. Thank you for Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the first thing you say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. In earth it says, in earth it says, but we don't expect it just to be in the dirt outside there. It must be in the highest earth. When man is filled with the power of God. 
and man is filled with the fullness of God. And Christ is reigning. I hear you singing, Thy throne, O Lord, is forever. And I'm there smiling. You don't know what you're saying. The throne of God will be in your heart. He said you will be the throne of God, the temple of the living God. And I will create an everlasting temple, he said. And if the temple is everlasting, then he can give you everlasting promises. You see. So if we, if we understand the word of God, it's just one word. And right through and through, we can see the word of God bringing forth life everywhere. Know who you are. Have a godly ambition. Don't let sin take you. When the man, Joseph, was faced with sin, he was tempted. That woman had been looking at him long ago. He, 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 knew, he, he knew she had a crush on him. Yes, and he was tempted. And when she grabbed him, he knew this is the moment of truth. How, oh, in his mind, how oh, can I do this great sin and sin against my God? That means he thought of it. Yes, he thought of just submitting to her. He would have a great time in the palace. Amen. But before him, he was faced with death. To resist her would be death. Because she was going to lie on him anyhow. And so he said, I would rather die. Brethren, God is asking you now to give up your lives. Make your life an offering now to God. Make up your mind that you will rather die than submit. And more than that, God is calling a people to be this precious treasure. And I want to be the precious treasure. And there are a lot of, thing, a lot of other things that I can be. And I'm saying, Lord God, if if so and so, if this action, if that action is standing on my rights over here, is going to take away my being that precious treasure, I'd rather die. I'd rather die. I told you the story how I made up my mind to die. Decided to die. Stop eat because the lust, the youthful lust that was within me would have destroyed what God was doing to me. And I was at a crossroad just like Joseph. And I said, let me die, my God. I stopped eat 40 days. God sat down there and watched me. <laughs> and he was watching me to see if I would break down. But I was determined. Blood was coming through my mouth. I was coughing. Couldn't hold myself down on the bed. Just coughing. And the blood was just battering out. I refused to drink water. Well, some of the willing workers banned from the church, women, came in one powerful woman and they held me down. And she took a spoon with water and put it out. And they took cornmeal poultice and put on my chest. I can't help myself, I'm weak. And when they had gone, God came to me. And he, he had a chart was showing me how I was going up the hill. And he took up the chart and put it down. And I said, you have to turn back. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
Hallelujah. And so we, we see then that scripture has us, but I want to, I want to indelibly mark you with these scriptures. There is a scripture and it is in the 19th chapter of what? Numbers. And I want you to see that scripture. Nineteenth chapter of Numbers. And it is in verse 2. Um, no, why did I have, I have numbers 19, it must be Leviticus. I'm talking about the red heifer. Yes. 19-2. Yes. And... It says here, eh, speak unto the, the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, ye shall be holy, for our Lord your God is holy. Ye shall fear, um, ye shall fear every man. No, it's numbers. Oh, it's numbers. Nine. Oh, come on, I just read it and it didn't read that. Okay. Or I might have been in Exodus. Oh, yes, I was in Exodus. Okay. Um, read it for me, Peter. Yeah, you, you are there. This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. Keep going. Yes, sir. And ye shall give... And ye shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. And Eleazar the priest shall take of her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. All right, praise God. We won't read the whole thing, but let me tell you the story. They take this red heifer and they burn the heifer burn him to ashes, everything. And they collect the ashes. And the ashes, they mix it with water. And they wash out the, 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 the temple with it. They wash the tabernacle with it. What's the meaning of that? <laughs> Remember, it's a heifer. It could not be Jesus himself. God is talking about the church in the last day, the final cleansing of the temple, that the church will be burnt with fire. Yeah. Going through death and being used to finally make a final washing of the church, of, of the temple of God. And I need to remind you that some people who belong to God, they are out there in the bars today, drinking. They are out there carousing. They are in Las Vegas. They are working in hell right now. And them also will I bring, said the Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. So that, that is one scripture that I wanted you to see. And... Um, we turn to the last scripture. Turn to the last scripture now. Which one is it? <laughs> Revelation 14. Revelation 14. You can't have a good message unless it ends in Revelation. Revelation. 
And you tell me what this means. For somebody don't believe the word. Eh? But God bless you. God help us all. God bless us. Help us to understand the word of God. Revelation 40. And I look. And lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. And with him an hundred and forty and four thousand. Having his father's name written in there for it. Um, having his name and his father's name written in their fire for it. The, um, the scripture said, the Greek says, two patros are two. His name, the father's name, and his name. So, the, he, he, he has the name of the father. That, that means to say, the nature of God is now written in the minds. Amen. You receive now the mark of God. Impossible. The mark of the beast is impossible. You can't be a beast anymore. Amen. There's, and he said 140 and 4,000. And I want to, to show you what that means. Brother, you can't distinguish. One hundred and forty and four thousand. Having the father's name and his name. When we talk about the father's name, we're talking about the nature of God. And the nature of Christ. Written in their foreheads. Yeah. And take out one from him. Um one one hundred is that good enough? Forty four zero 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 one forty four equal twelve by twelve one forty four this equals twelve equals put here twelve equals completion Can it be read? All right. 12 equals completion. 12 by 12 means a completed man in a completed body. Completed man, completed body. So the completed man is 12, and the completed body is 12. And it is 12 multiplied by 12. So you get 144. And that scripture says that 144 cubits is the width of the wall, the wall of the new Jerusalem. So if you understand the whole thing, you will understand how true this is. Now, the zero... Zero equals the seed. Equals Christ. In scripture, anything that is repeated three times is the fullness. So zero, zero, zero equal fullness of Christ. So, so then, what are we seeing? Jesus Christ, the Lamb, 
was standing on Mount Zion. Now, Zion is the seventh letter in the Hebrew language, which value is seven. Zion, seventh letter in Hebrew. And it means perfection. Come on now. So the Zion, sorry, the Zion Company is the perfect man, perfected man. Oh, okay. Somebody need to pull it up a little bit. I can see. I, I suppose everybody can see it, right? Yes. That there is, is the Hebrew Z, Zion. And it is the seventh letter, and it, the value of it is seven. And God uses that word to show his strong ones, his completed man. So then that David created the city of Zion. Hallelujah. All by the revelation of God. Now, here we are then. He said, Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Now, when you refer, when they refer to Jesus in Scripture as many different things. For instance, one place he's referred to as a lion. All right? But this place is referred to as a lamb. So what is the meaning of that? Uh, is, is in his capacity as dying for our sins, as an offering, right? So Jesus Christ, the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, <laughs> he's standing upon the perfection now, and with him, he's not alone. He has a lot more like himself now, Zion company now, standing with him, the completed man in a completed body, in nature and the fullness of Christ with the nature of God, the Father in his forehead, in his mind, and in Christ in him. That's the meaning of 144,000. So if anybody tells you that 144,000 is a natural number and it means Jews or anything like that, just tell, you know he's uninformed. Amen. This information came from God. I, I didn't, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I'm not to say student, but I am. <laughs> I mean, God made me a student and he sat down there with me for seven months and taught me. And there's no way that I could believe anything else but what he tells me. Amen. And I uh, challenge the church because there are some things that I might say out of my mouth which is I am saying it. But the church is not supposed to allow it. Do you understand why God created a body? Amen. If, if I am saying something that you don't understand you don't believe go ask God just ask God <laughs> I know many men do that they ask God and God tell them yes you know he's talking truth so if you can get a word from God to say that what I am saying is not right then I will have to go back to God and say my God he said, the brother said you told him that this wasn't right and then I will be corrected but if I'm deceived, the church is not supposed to be deceived. The church is supposed to hear from God. Amen. Now, so this 144,000, 
Now, the scripture went further to describe these people who they are. And we go down into verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women. Now, he's not talking about natural women. He's talking about the, 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 the women that caught Samson. The churches, the false churches that catch people and destroy them. And we are coming out of this system. All this falsehood that the church has imbibed. God is bringing us out of them. This is why he says the people who handle the heifer have to wash, them, wash themselves in clear water. And they, because outside there, they would be contaminated. They couldn't come back into the tabernacle unless they were cleaned up. And they must wait till the evening before they can be cleaned. Don't you understand? The church will not really be perfected and clean until the evening. The evening in which we are. We are in the evening of time. And God Almighty is cleansing the church. And the last cleansing will be given your lives before God. And that will finish the job. So these, um, he said, these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins these are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth these were redeemed from among men being the first fruits huh being the first fruits unto god and to the lamb and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Hallelujah. No, is it possible to, to, to make a mistake there? After God goes through such details to explain to us who these people are and who you will be if you are diligent to be part of this company. You, you understand what I'm saying. Amen. Praise be to God. So, the, 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 the company that are redeemed, I, I want you to understand what is meant by redemption. Jesus Christ died and he redeemed my soul from hell. He took me out of death and he gave me life. But I have a part of me that is not redeemed. Did you know that? Huh? Yeah. Part of you is still in debt. Not redeemed. Turn to Romans 8. Turn to Romans 8. For I have decided to give you the, all the scriptures... I'm not going to assume that you know anything. Yeah. You know, that's why I said this, this man, Paul, was a marvelous, marvelous gift of God to the church because he, he went into certain things that nobody else, none of the other apostles, understood Eh? For you know, verse 22, you know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. The first fruits. Don't you understand? Remember now, we just read about the first fruits. And it was said by an angel. It was an angel speaking to, 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 to John in a vision that spoke about the first fruits. Amen. And here is 
Paul writing about the first fruits. Yes. For, yes, first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. That piece of earth that you have there unto you, you call it a body, it is a veil that is separating you from perfection. Amen. You can't go out and kill yourself to get perfect. You're gone. Because the last act you committed was sin. He said, anyone destroy the body, God, the, the temple of the living God. He said, anyone destroy the temple, God will destroy him. So, I, I hope you get it right. Hallelujah. Yes. And it says here, the redemption to wit, the redemption of the body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? So when we talk about we are saved, we are saved, praise God, by hope. We are coming to the day when we will be saved completely. Amen. But right now, you have a piece of earth unto you there that is pulling you down from being what God wants you to be. Amen. So then, they, he said, they love not their lives unto the dead. Amen. Praise God. They love not their lives unto the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You must be the offering. Hallelujah. You must be the offering. When you start putting your offering in the plate, offer your soul. Amen. Don't forget that the offering that the priest put down was not only the incense, but was his soul that he was offering. And that was what made you a priest. Hallelujah. And that's what makes you the king. Hallelujah. And he said he shall make you priests and kings. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I 